start, one of our guest speakers has been slightly delayed, but hopefully is, is on his way. Uh, yeah, that, that is, yeah. <laughs> Wisely, neither Simon nor Shirley were on the invite list for the meeting. Uh, but thank you very much all for coming along to this fringe meeting. My name's Mark Pack, I'm one of the co-editors of Liberal Democrat Voice, and this meeting is looking at some of the campaigning lessons for the 2010 election. Uh, I think this is the fifth party conference I've come to in the autumn after a general election, and it's notable that this is probably the conference at which we've generally been talking about lessons from the election least, uh, understandably in many ways, because politics has moved on so massively. But part of that, I think, means that the stakes for us as a political party over the next few years are actually far higher than they probably ever have been since the late 1980s when we were on the verge of disappearing completely as a party. Uh, a large part of that will depend upon what happens in government <coughs> and on policy issues, but I think there's no doubt that campaigning will also have an even more important role to play over the next few years, given the huge stakes we're now playing for as a political party. And hence, learning the lessons from this election are, is a particularly important. So thank you very much for all coming along. A uh, couple of sort of bits of housekeeping before we get into the, the guest speakers. Uh, firstly, you will have, see circulating shortly uh, some sign-up sheets where you can sign up to Lib Dem Voices daily email, which I think Helen will be passing around in a moment, uh, which lets you get the headlines from the Lib Dem Voice blog conveniently in your inbox every morning. It also lets you see how many comments people have posted. So if you really hate blogs with lots of comments, you can see which are the posts to ignore and which are the ones <laughs> to click through to read. Uh, and there are also flyers, flyers on your seats uh, about, about the blog, if you're somebody who isn't a reader of the blog. And surprisingly enough, uh, although we've not got a raffle at this, which I know is normally traditional at Liberal Democrat events, we do have a standing order form on the back, because Liberal Democrat Voice is a... Uh, we have no trade union funding, and we have no... <laughs> <laughs> and sadly, so many of you keep on coming to read the site that our, our hosting costs keep on going up and up and up, and we do, have to, we do have to pay them. So if you are able to contribute financially, that would be much appreciated. But enough of the housekeeping, in, on, on to our speakers. Our first speaker uh, is Hilary Stevenson, who's the party's director of campaigns. And I think I remember when I first sort of encountered Hillary quite a few years ago, I remember asking, asking a colleague, who is, who is this Hillary? And actually, is, is Hillary man or woman? And, and the answer I got, and actually, you know this, the answer I was given was actually, the thing you need to know about Hillary is that she has this strange habit of success following her round. And if you look at the seats that Hillary has been involved in mm. over the elections, and then you look at the parliamentary party, there is a huge overlap between where Hillary has been and where we get MPs elected. So a tip for any would-be candidates, persuade Hillary to come and live near, near, near the seat that you're intending to stand in. <laughs> Hillary is also the cause of the strangest election law query I ever had uh, when I was working for the party in the 2004 European elections, where Hillary rang me up to say, I've got a, got a, got a question for you about whether something will count as treating. We have a, some of our keen supporters in the North West have arranged a traditional poetry reading evening at which food and drink will be served. Now, will that count as treating? So I went through the usual sort of questions about how much food and drink and is it traditional uh, to ha have food and drink at those events or not. And then I, for some reason I just thought, actually, one question, by the way, Hillary, will the poetry in any way influence how people are going to vote? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, uh, Hillary's answer, unfortunately, so I, uh, Hillary's answer was, well, actually, the poetry isn't in English, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know. But as Hillary didn't end up in jail, I presume it was all OK. So over to you, Hillary. Thank you. Um, OK, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, we did win the seed. Thank you very much. Yes. That went, that went well. um, OK. Um, so the question is, is what lessons do we learn? I'd like to say a bit of background first, but just also to say that what I'm going to say is um, based on a, on a mixture of sources, really, um, quite a lot of one-to-one -one talking to local parties, to candidates, um, quite a lot of anecdotal evidence, therefore, on one side, but also quite a range of surveys and um, research that we've undertaken or had access to. Um, for example, there's been a survey of 800 members uh, across the party, a survey of new members uh, as well. Um, internal polling that we commissioned, uh, commercial polling that we've commissioned immediately <coughs> following the election to give us an idea of people's memories while they could still remember the details of this about what they'd done and why they'd done it. 
um, and an online survey that we've done ourselves uh, from the campaigns department, which was uh, of was actually uh, to all local parties, and out of that we got, I thought, a, a really <coughs> impressive response of over 600, nearly 700 people, and covering 450 other local parties. So you know, quite a considerable amount of feedback. Much of it anecdotal, much of it obviously from people's particular angles, but but so much of it that I think it is worth looking at. And then of course there are things like um, they've done voices own surveys and all of those sorts of things as well. So it's a kind of eclectic mix of impressions to which I'm sure that you you will add today. Um, I want to go back though just first of all and talk a little bit about the background because. Um, it is really amazing how fast we all forget, um, and if I do, I'm sure you do as well, where we were coming from in this election and some of the things that happened during it. Um, we went into these elections, we, well, we came out of the two, 2005 elections, not well placed. We came out in a situation where we had the proportion of risks as against opportunities for the Liberal Democrats was not favourable compared to with the other two parties in a very, very significant way. Uh, we had less opportunities to gain seats that were, we were close between one and 5,000. We'd kind of maxed out on quite a lot of what we were targeting. And we had more opportunities to lose to the other parties um, on, in that sort of range. And hence the predictions of a lot of electoral pundits that actually we were going to come out with 25 seats, with 30 seats, with 40 seats, whatever it might be. And that was pretty much a perceived wisdom of the pessimistic group of people. And I have to say, there are quite a lot of those in the Liberal Democrats at times um, <laughs> telling us that that, that that was going to happen. And that, that, is, that is one bit of background. That's not in any way to say that that would have been a great result to settle for. It certainly wouldn't. And there is no way that uh, that was in anybody's idea something that was satisfactory. Nevertheless, there were some authoritative predictions out there with some foundation that we could end up there. It was a regime change election, and I think the thing that um, people were most taxed about last March's conference, for example, and around that time, was this whole thing of that tremendous squeeze that we were going to be under that we all knew we were going to be under, which was going to be actually very, very difficult to answer. Um, so that's the second thing, which was going to be tougher this time round. Um, I have to say, from our point of view, there was an assumption. I think this is fundamental to answering some of the questions about, about perhaps how we approach elections in future. There was an assumption that, as was business as normal, the job was to get ourselves into the story how different that is from, from how we look back on it now. <laughs> but the job was to get ourselves into the story. Here was the two, the two parties. This was going to be an election, regime change election between those parties. We had to get ourselves in there somehow. And an awful lot of what we were doing in this was modelled around that. And the need to create the volume and the noise to do that, <coughs> rather than perhaps to equip ourselves <coughs> to deal with policy issues and with a level of scrutiny. <coughs> that was something which we'd never had before. And so I think there, there are a number of things about the approaches that's different. And a, and a fourth and final thing, of course, we went into that election, let's remind ourselves, with many people in the party saying, not many people know who this Nick Clegg is. <laughs> not many people know who this, who the, who this leader is. Um, and, and even, you know, should we perhaps be using him a little bit because people don't know who he is? Um, and we were saying all along, all those of us who've been through a few elections, that you know this was the case with Paddy Ashdown in his time, with any new leader, that the first general election raises their profile. So there's another assumption out there, which has changed so radically since, I think, that we have to think ourselves back a little bit in this to understand what we're doing, but also possibly to be a little bit more open in the future to a bit of wider scenario planning about what might happen in different, less expected circumstances. And I think that's one of the, for, for me, that's one of the hindsight things. It's easy now, but to look at that and say, could we have modelled the situation we ended up in? Could, could we, in our wildest imaginations, have, have done that? Possibly not, but it's something, I think, to be aware of in terms of lessons to learn. Because, of course, when we, when we got there, being in the story really wasn't a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick Clegg's name recognition really wasn't a problem. Um, so things turned so much in that election. 
that I think there, there is a whole area of, of us looking at the things we were trying to achieve and perhaps modelling what would happen if we actually did achieve some of those things. Um, also, finally, it was, it was the <coughs> first time, I think, really, that we had been fighting an election on two fronts, that we've been fighting more or less equally in terms of our ambitions against Labour and against the Conservatives. Uh, Defence is obviously chiefly against the Conservatives, but you know, an opportunity against Labour as well. And always in those circumstances, it was likely that we would go down one channel or the other. We would either get our Labour gains and have a problem with the Tories or vice versa. And in fact, that's not really quite where we ended up. I mean, in terms of gains, we took three from the Conservatives, we took five from Labour. So, I mean, there is, there, what we did actually manage to fight on two fronts um, in that respect. So I think there are two questions really out of the election. One is how, what can we learn about how did we confound the, the absolute pessimists? Um, we did run the biggest volume campaign in all sorts of ways, from the air war and the media, through the mailings and the literature campaign, the staffing and all of those things. And for the first time on a lot of those things, we fought on a level playing field with the other two parties, or something approaching that. It actually wasn't a level playing field, but it was a hell of a sight nearer than it ever had been before. Um, and the effect of Nick and the media profile, I'm sure, was, was part of that, making sure that we, we did confound the absolute pessimists on this. Why did, the second question, though, is why didn't we manage to capitalise on the thing that happened to us part of the way through the election. Um, I think one of the things we have to remind ourselves on this, um, we, look, we need also to look at the things we could do something about, but one of the things is that media during the last week, I'd forgotten until we had a, did a training session earlier this week, that's, uh, or a campaign session earlier this week, some of you may have been in, where we had a look at those last week newspapers <laughs> and the headlines on the front of them. Um, that media assault at the end is something that was <coughs> absolutely <coughs> colossal. That's not to say we should lie down and be victims of it, but one of the things we have to look at and keep looking at is how we, how we deal with that. Um, I have to say also that if anybody had told me a month out that in the last two weeks the two biggest is issues that would be talked about would be immigration and the hung parliament, um, I might not have been that that uh, ambitious. And it's interesting, in fact, that um, in our big survey of, of all seats, um, are, when people were asked the question, what were the biggest issues in your area in that last week, in the last two weeks, 31% said immigration, 22% said hung parliaments, 14% said tax. Mm. What was our main message? It was tax. And mm. um, that is a perception thing, but it's actually very much, you know, where people were at that end. And what is very, very clear is that, is that we, we normally, I think, fight, um, fight elections thinking in terms of what we can do locally. And in this election, a lot of that was swept aside by the national. That said, the other things, there are two things that we can do something about, I think. One was the effect of the election and the lack of focus that came um, with, in a very difficult way with a lot of our local parties um, in terms of thinking that maybe we should be broadening our, our outlook. Very difficult to have a media optimism strategy but also say to people in the seats, well actually no, you've got to concentrate on doing stuff in your area and how do we deal with that kind of thing. Um, and the other thing is just sheer infrastructure in so many of our places. A lot of people are saying perhaps we did too many leaflets. We didn't do too many leaflets because I can tell you that the other two parties matched us in most of our target seats and more than matched us, the Labour Party um, and the Tories um, over a lot of that period, particularly the Tories, they did more things like magazines, they did more direct mail than we did in all the seats where we were fighting them seriously. So we do need to do all those things but we need the feet on the ground and the effort to also go out there and knock on doors. So lessons quickly, lessons for seats. We know from having looked at what's happened and, and who did well, not necessarily who won, but who made advances. Continuous activity is one of the things 
that has defined uh, success. If you look at the places that didn't have a break of a couple of years and backpedal, <coughs> and particularly the places that actually had an ongoing strategy of winning the intervening elections, keeping up the momentum, building the infrastructure, um, and also having teams, therefore. And, of course, the, the ever-present money, um, a big, big factor. So those are some local lessons. Um, for the party generally, I think, as I said at the beginning, let's model these scenarios more, more carefully. Let's look at how this might go for us and how we have that ongoing message that really keeps momentum going when, when the door opens for us. Um, creating the infrastructure centrally, and we're back to money again. Um, although I said we were on a more level playing field, we did not have a national phone bank. We did not have... Um, the mechanisms for much of the mailing that would have given us the fast turnaround that we needed on many of those things towards the end. So there's a huge infrastructural challenge for the party. Um, there is staying at the cutting edge on things like uh, the social media aspects, um, but also uh, on how we fight AD uh, when we win the refer referendum next year. Um, so that's my, those are my general lessons. Um, I think we can learn things from other parties. The other parties out-researched us and out-attacked us. And we have a lot of nice Liberal Democrats who don't like um, attacking the opposition, even on factual things. Uh, again, our surveys show very clearly that the proportion of attack in their literature was much greater than in ours in some of the places where they were successful. And I think we have to be well-based, <coughs> research-based, factually-based, not personal attacks, but we have an issue that we can improve on that side as well. Um, lessons not to learn and I'm going to finish with one on that we do need to make sure that we have continuous campaigning and a big factor in that is our candidates and if we do not have candidates in place relatively early we will have a big problem creating that favourability and that profile that we know from all of the research and the polling we've done was a key indicator of success. So I'll just say at the end of that, I remember 92 when I was in a seat which was a target seat and didn't win by 929 votes. And I remember going through the conference the September after, desperately searching for what it was we could have done that we didn't do and at the end, and so I know how people feel on this, I know how it feels to be somewhere where you did everything right and it didn't work. And the only conclusion I came to at the end of that was that we should have done more of it. And I have to say, the next time round, five years later, we won by 11,000. We did more of it. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, Paul Holmes, actually I think was the cause of not only his own success in 2001, but actually I suspect many of our successes <coughs> in 2005, because when we gained the seat of Chesterfield in 2001, it was the first time we had gained a seat from Labour without the aid of a defection or a by-election for far too many decades. And I think a lot of us, including myself when I was running a campaign in Hornsey Wood Green at the next election, learnt an awful lot from what Paul and his team did and did right. Uh, so it was a great pleasure to see Paul winning in 2001. It was also a real tragedy to see that one of, one of the small number of games Labour made was to deprive, of, deprive us of Paul still <coughs> representing Liberal Democrats in the Houses of Parliament. But I'm sure that hasn't quieted your views in any way. <laughs> and so, uh, OK, thanks a lot. Yeah, you can tell uh, I'm not the MP anymore. Duncan's in the suit. <laughs> <laughs> there are advantages to losing your seat, although not many. Um, right, back, background first of all. Um, I joined the SDP in 1983. I was 26 years old. In my life up to that point, growing up in Sheffield, University in York, living in Chesterfield from 1979, I'd never had a Liberal leaflet through my door, ever. Um, I'd never had an SDP leaflet, but then there <coughs> a lot of air publicity. Of the leaflets that had gone through my door that I'm conscious of in those first 26 years, nine out of every ten were Labour. There weren't very many of them, because I always lived in rock-solid, safe Labour areas, a big council estate in Sheffield and then into Chesterfield. Um, 
So I, I joined the SDP uh, national campaign, filled in a coupon from a newspaper, sent it off. Nobody contacted me, so I contacted them a few months later. Um, and this was in a, in a constituency where there were no councillors. The most they'd ever had since World War II was three at any one time, but they'd lost those. So there were no councillors, and we'd been third in every election since World War II. I decided to stand for election for the council in the ward I lived in in, in very late 1985. And about f 16 months later, we won that ward. The first time Labour had ever lost it, ever, in the 20th century. Um, and how did I do it? Well, it was really simple. I got a little pamphlet, it was about 30 pages long, written for ALDC by a young chap, some of you have heard of, called Chris Renard, <laughs> <laughs> who had just got his, fir his first full-time job as the uh, East Midlands campaign organiser for the Liberal Party. And I went through, for, I mean, I'd never won an election. I'd, I'd been and helped in a few by elections by that time, but I've seen some really bad ones and some good ones. Um, and I, I just followed it from page one to page 30, doing whatever I could. There were three of us delivering leaflets and two of us delivery leaflets and canvassing, and I say we won the ward, um, but by doing whatever we could that Chris and I have told us, and by and large since then I've always done what campaigns department told me, and it's been pretty successful. Um, in 23 years, I, I, I became, after winning in 87, I became the voluntary campaign organiser for Chesterfield from 1987, 88 through to 1999 um, uh, in my spare time after work, and then I became the candidate in 99, and then one in 2001. So for 23 years, nearly a quarter of a century, every election we fought in Chesterfield from 1987 until this year, we got a better result than in the previous election. So every set of borough council elections was better than the previous one. Mm. Every set of county council elections was mm. better than the previous one. Every general election result was better than the previous one um, until this year when we missed by 500 votes. Um, so what do I think are some of the lessons that we need to think about or or debate for, for the future. I mean, the first one is there are no easy answers. I mean, I think it was Lib Dem Voice I read on a, a few weeks ago. There was, a, there was one posted, uh, has the internet made focus redundant? No, 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 no. Internet, tweeting, all the rest of it is, I'm, I'm sorry to say it at a Lib, uh, Lib Dem Voice um, fringe, it, it's fairly marginal to elections. I mean, it may get bigger in the future. And a lot of people quoted Obama. I spent a week uh, in America studying the primary elections in America, uh, half of the time with the Democrats, half of the time with the Republicans, and uh, I, I did a little bit of campaigning for Obama in uh, um, south of Chicago when he, he won a primary that Hillary Clinton was 14% ahead, and he won it by 0.9%, and that was me. <laughs> 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 um, and what the Obama campaign did point out very strongly when people ran away saying, oh, it was all the internet, all the internet fundraising, all the, that was a supplement. What they did was the traditional phone banking, door knocking, leaflets, and what they call stand-ups on motorway junctions, which was interesting at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, they, they just did more of that. They did it better. They did more of it than they used to. And they added all the internet stuff as a, a purely as a supplement. It was not a replacement for anything. So there's no easy answer through uh, the internet and tweeting and focus. is not redundant. Uh, air wars. Ev every conference <coughs> after every election, people go on about... What we need is a much better air war and much less of this targeting. Um, because if we have a good air war, we can all sweep into victory without having to do all that boring four, five, ten years of hard work beforehand. Um, and it's just not true. Um, you know, we had a good air war in general, and particularly good uh, after the first uh, leaders' debate. Um, we, we sold up to 30, 32%, but then we went back down to 23. But if we'd have got 28% of the vote on polling day, how much difference would it have made? You know, well, I'd have still been an MP. But... Um, <laughs> But we would have had 20 or 30 more seats. Instead of 57, we'd have had 80, 90. You know, we would not have swept into 100, 150, 200 because we did not have the infrastructure on the ground in enough seats to make that difference. And Tories and Labour can do it. We can't. I mean, the Tory campaign, for example, if you go back to 2009, the county council elections in Europe, um, the Tory vote in Chesterfield nearly doubled from 8% to 15%, still way back in third place. Now, it, it wasn't because they campaigned. And there were two wards out of 19 where they campaigned in 2009. And the percentage increase they had in those two wards in the posh end of Chesterfield, which is quite a small bit of Chesterfield, um, <laughs> was almost exactly the same as the percentage increase they had in the most deprived, dire council state, which is quite a lot of in Chesterfield, where they'd done no campaigning, no leaflets, nothing whatsoever. Because it was just a 7% uplift that they got across the board. Clay Cross, a beast of Bolsover's territory originally, where Dennis Skinner and his brothers grew up, um, 
uh, the Clay Cross Rent Rebels of 1973 who refused to implement Ted Heath's mm -hmm. rent rise and got surcharged and bankrupted and disqualified from office. One of them only just came out of that, that disqualification about a year ago. Um, the Tories nearly won Clay Cross. They put one leaflet out and they nearly won it. The Beast of Bowls over his own backyard. Um, and, it, and it wasn't because of intensive local campaigning for them, it was because of national image, national air war, um, and, of course, and Labour did that in 95, when Tony Blair was creating new Labour and he had his close four weekend where he rewrote the socialism of the Labour Party and turned it something new, the, the weekend before polling day, um, and, and they swept seats all over the country. But they've got a century of people growing up in families saying, well, we always vote Labour, we always vote Tory. We've not. In, apart from a very few tiny bits of the UK, we've not. Um, they've got, the Tories have got 80% of the press owned by Tory supporting propagandists. And the rest of it basically is the Daily Mirror in terms of circulation, which is Labour. We don't have that. And the only way, you, the only way we can batter through is by really intensive local targeted campaigns. So th there's no soft option like internet campaigning or tweeting or air wars. Air wars are nice and all the rest of it is nice. But you, you do have to have the, the heavy elections. And Hil Hillary mentioned selection. I mean, I understand that the first English candidate, the first candidates committee after the election, I, were actually suggesting that nobody should be able to select a candidate until at least 2013. Um, boundary Commission, wait till that, and all the rest of it. So one person at that meeting actually said, in all seriousness, they would like to see no candidates picked until about four months before the election, because otherwise they burn out with the effort. <laughs> Which, to some degree, is true sometimes, but nonetheless, that's reality. And at a more recent candidates committee meeting, although they're seeing sense now on sele early selections, um, somebody seriously suggested, but we've got all these um, you know, people in high-flying, well-paid jobs, celebrity candidates, they're not going to spend the next five years campaigning to get elected. So we ought to wait, we shouldn't let the target seats pick, until about a year before the election, because then the celebrities and the famous ones and the important people, they, they can step in as a nice sideways career move at the last minute. Mm. Now, they do that in the Labour Party, they do that in the Tory Party. But, you know, what is it, a third of the constituents in this country have not changed hands since World War II? But, like, you know, two of them are ours, or one of them is ours. You know? <laughs> we don't have safe seats where you can do that, where, you know, there's lots of Labour seats, which are the ones I know best, where when you're picked, you're elected, that's it. The battle is winning the selection through the the union block votes and, and, and the constituency votes. It's not fighting the election, that's just a formality. <laughs> we don't have that luxury. Now when we've got PR, preferably STV, and AV is only a very slight step towards that, while ever we've got first past the post and AV, there is no alternative to the really intensive long-term uh, campaign. So, no easy options. <coughs> the, 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 only, the, the other point I, I would raise though is one which I don't know the answer to, but it's about uh, and so he said, we've got to learn from our opponents. Now, what Labour, one of the things Labour did in Chesterfield, and John Leach, Manchester Witherington, says he saw exactly the same thing there, and I've heard third hand somebody saying it was the same in, some of the same in Liverpool Labour Tree. They've got a lot smarter at campaigning. Mm -hmm. And what they did in Chesterfield, and what John Leach says they clearly did in his patch, was they delivered very few leaflets by hand during the election itself. And that was a, a clear campaign plan they were working to. All their activist effort that they could was put into canvassing, personal contact on the door, which has all sorts of knock-on effects for, for all the obvious reasons about getting posters up and picking up the issues and um, the, the, the old research in America. You know, Clinton used to work to this when he'd stand at the traffic lights shaking hands with the cars, uh, people in the cars at the traffic lights. That if somebody's met the candidate, they're more likely to actually turn out and to vote because of the physical contact. And you know, of course, a lot of people say, well, our trouble is we deliver so many leaflets that we don't do enough on the doorstep. Now, Labour have found a way around that. It's brilliant. It's called having lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> and it did amuse me, all the stuff in the run-up to the election for a couple of years about Labour's bankrupt, Labour can't fight an election campaign. But there was no sign of that in Chesterfield. For two years before the election, they were pouring money into direct mail, um, which is, is great because, you know, you don't have to do it in-house in your local <coughs> constituency office. You don't have to have the envelope stuffing machines going. You don't have to write all your own leaflets and sit over the laser printer and all the rest of it. Um, you just email your data off to some, somebody uh, up in Northumberland or in London and they do it for you and they give it to TNT and they give it to Royal Mail and it goes through the doors. Uh, but it costs a fortune. And in the, 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 the short expenses started on a Monday and in the week before the short expenses started, short campaign expenses, Labour, we picked up in, in that one week six different leaflets and letters that had gone as target mail to different audiences in Chesterfield. Six 
totally different ones, you know, not, not repeating the same message with just one sentence different, totally different to different audiences, six of them uh, in one week, and they, they've been doing that um, pretty intensively back in 2009 for the county elections when they were desperately trying to hold on to Dodge County Council, they thought it might be the only one in the country they'd still hang on to. Uh, but through and really intensively, um, uh, you know, in the sort of four, five, six months run up to the general election. Now, how do we match that? I don't know because we haven't got the money to do that. Um, and so we go out delivering leaflets, and it's a problem. And I don't know quite how you get around it. Um, targeting strategy, I mean, we had a couple of constituencies who had been asked to help us, but they wouldn't come and help because they were going to win. <coughs> the canvas, Nick Clegg had done so well in that air war. The opinion polls were shooting up, their canvassing was really good, they were going to win. Well, they came third, as they always do, um, and had they come and helped, we'd probably have had the other 490 votes we needed. So perhaps you need a more rigorous targeting strategy, rather than getting a bit carried away, because while ever we're under first past the post, or AB, um, it's the only way you're going to make serious inroads into winning seats. Yeah. Our sort of final speaker, Duncan, I first met, I think it must have been in 1999 or early 2000, when there was a by-election in Tottenham, um, where I think, I mean, it was quite a fun by-election, but I think it does say something about our ability to fight Labour successfully in seats like that, that uh, my best memory of the by-election was the fun we had dismantling the door on the kitchen, which then kept on getting jammed in different places around the office and hindered our movement around the office and we were trying to desperately get the door out of the way. We have luckily progressed somewhat in our ability to fight by-election campaigns against Labour since then. I have to say there were two, uh, two particular pleasant gains that we saw on election night for me personally in terms of people whose political paths had crossed through Haringey uh, at various times in the past. One was Steve Gilbert. Down in, down in Cornwall, who had previously been a councillor in Haringey, and the other was Duncan, who has gone on to much better things than a by-election candidate who worries about kitchen doors. So, over to you, Duncan. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And um, uh, firstly, I should apologise for, for not being here at the very beginning of this session. But you're an important MP. I, I can assure you, it's not, it's not um, by virtue of double booking my diary at any stage. Uh, but one thing that I hadn't allowed for in, in my diary planning was that uh, my walking speed has, has c come close to a halt at this conference, um, uh, and, um, uh, and so uh, my apologies for that. Um, in drawing lessons from the last election, from my experience as a candidate, uh, I, I think a lot of the important things uh, that I want to share with you uh, come down to one word, and that word is relationships. I'm going to share with you uh, a story uh, that uh, Jeremy Brown uh, had uh, shared with me prior uh, to uh, my campaign in Chippenham. Uh, uh, place that in the context of some advice uh, that uh, we got from Andrew Stunnell at uh, one of our training events. And, uh, but then leave you to chew on it a bit more with, with a dilemma, which uh, uh, I now have um, on that front. Um, and, um, and then I, I, I'm, I'm going to say... Um, a few remarks about uh, people uh, and I'll pick up on one or two things that Paul has said uh, because um, uh, I, th yeah, I think there are things which need saying um, uh, on that front and so I'll try to do that. So firstly on relationships, Jeremy Brown at uh, a uh, campaigns uh, department training session probably in Y Boston or Peterborough uh, uh, told me a story, I think it must have been shortly after he'd been elected to Taunton, which is not a million miles away from Chippenham, uh, with a fairly small majority in a seat that had been marginal for a long time, uh, one way or the other. And uh, uh, superficially, his advice was, uh, Duncan, you've got to visit all of the old people's homes. Uh, which um, uh, I didn't do, and uh, given how long the Parliament lasted, it's probably just as well that I didn't. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, behind that superficial, that the the, 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 uh, uh, the wisdom in his advice, uh, in the rest of what he said to me, uh, was uh, about getting out and meeting people and how there is a proportion of the community in every constituency that is involved, that does things, that gets out and about. And um, once you start going to events and you start getting out and meeting people, you'll soon start to find that at other events that you turn up to as a candidate, at which you thought you'd know no one at all, 
you actually know a few other people that you've uh, done some casework for, you've met at a previous event, or heard you talk about something, or are involved in your campaign on this. <coughs> and uh, it, takes, it takes some uh, perseverance, and uh, one of the things I found difficult as a candidate was um, you know, turning up to something and not really feeling I had any particular justification to be there. Um, but um, I had to tell myself, no, Duncan, you're going to be the next Member of Parliament here, and they're going to be glad that you were here. Um, and, uh, but after you've done that enough, you reach this critical mass of people that you've made contact mm. with in your constituency. And um, you haven't made contact necessarily with them in a very political way. Uh, you've made contact with them in a very personal way. And all of a sudden, uh, these events become a lot easier to do because you recognise people and people recognise you and come over and speak to you. And you're not Billy No Mates wondering what he's doing there. Because uh, actually, you are at the heart of this community and uh, people want you to be involved in what they're passionate about. And um, uh, this gave me quite a spring in my step in the uh, latter years of the campaign in Chippenham. And I think uh, uh, resulted in quite a few dividends when we moved into the final general election campaign itself. Uh, people that came out of the woodwork, people that weren't necessarily on our helpers and supporters list, but had an affinity with me and recognised my involvement in the community. Uh, so um, that's not tweeting, that's not um, uh, an excuse, and it's not a substitute for focus or canvassing. But it is a very important part, I think, of establishing credibility as a candidate. And I think it proved to be particularly useful in a, in a, a regime change election, as Henry described it, uh, where um, you know, people wanted to vote for someone that they could trust, uh, and, and you know, there's no substitute for personal contact to do that. Um, a, the piece of advice that Andrew Stunnell gave us at another one of these mm -hmm. uh, sessions, which um, I'm sure was meant slightly flippantly, but I'm hoping he won't mind me uh, repeating it, uh, was... Um, to the effect of, uh, when it comes to the national campaign, if you're lucky, it will do nothing to harm your chances of election. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure he had no idea of quite what an uh, advantageous uh, um, contribution certain elements of the national campaign were going to prove to be. Uh, but the, uh, the point he was trying to make at that time uh, was that as local candidates, we needed to insulate ourselves from whatever happened in a part of the campaign that was completely out of our control. And these relationships that I was talking about, and the relationships that you will strike up in other ways through your campaigning, do insulate you from what people are reading uh, on the front page of The Sun or in the editorial in the Daily Mail. Uh, and uh, certainly, when people were... Uh, losing all faith in politicians as they were in 2009, uh, relationships were what um, mm. uh, insulated uh, me and meant that um, there were plenty of people um, who were able to say, as they said about many Liberal Democrat MPs, you know, I don't trust these politicians, oh, these MPs, all on the make, but my MP, she, he's all right, I know, because. Mm. And... Um, and so, in future campaigns, it will still be the case, that whilst we can't foresee exactly what the issue will be, there will be things that you will need to be insulated from. And people feeling they know you and that you are different because they know you is incredibly valuable to that. So, uh, finally on this point, my dilemma, Duncan's dilemma, is that actually maintaining relationships uh, uh, invariably involves a lot of time. And um, whilst I agree with reducing the number of MPs, <coughs> Um, even if we didn't reduce the number of MPs, when there are 75,000 people in your constituency, in your electorate, um, there is a certain impossibility about that. And we, di we did used to work on the assumption that um, you, know, you, you can in engage in until you exhaust the appetite for it, uh, because you know, there are only so many people that are interested in politics, only so many people who will write a letter to the Member of Parliament. Well, you know, whether it is through technology or simply through our determination on the basis that I've already outlined, um, we are stretching that envelope all the time. And, um, uh, and I'm certainly uh, in a situation already uh, where I'm struggling to stay on top of the expectations about uh, my level of interaction. Um, and, uh, and yet it's not something that I want to 
um, apply the brake to, but we need to find smart ways of making sure that, that people uh, can uh, feel engaged uh, and that we can find efficient ways in which we can do the most um, uh, basic level of that interaction so that uh, we have the time and the resources available to, to invest in the more um, more involved interactions that follow. So um, I'll welcome your advice in the comments that follow about how best we can do that. Um, I don't think it's been said already, but goodness, um, you, know, you should always uh, say this, think of this in these kind of sessions. Um, there's no, it's no good fighting the last war. Um, and uh, I'm afraid we do that quite a lot as a party, don't we? Uh, so, um, <coughs> yes, yeah, it's helpful to learn lessons from the last campaign, but we've got to make sure that we're answering the questions for the next one. Um, I, I certainly think uh, that AV uh, will, will make it very different in many respects. I think one of the um, uh, unintended, perhaps, consequences of AV um, is that actually um, it will be a lot easier for voters to deny us their first preference. And we're not going to be able to get all of their second preferences. For many of them, their first preference is still going to be in contention with us in the final stage of the election. Uh, so um, we've got a real challenge there, I think. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the first question you ask yourself uh, under a, a preferential voting system uh, is often, how do I make sure I get those second preferences? Because they're the new thing in the election. Well, actually, I think we've got to ask ourselves, how can we make sure that our support doesn't become second preferences? Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's a key key strategic political question for the party in doing that. Um, I, could not, I could not have won uh, the election in the Chippenham constituency without the absolutely phenomenal commitment, <coughs> effort and talent of my constituency campaigns organiser, Daniel Kelly. And um, you know, you've, you've got candidates at this panel um, but um, you know, don't let that deceive you. That um, I'm sure you realise uh, the people that aren't on the stage, the people that aren't on the platform, are absolutely critical to us being able to deliver results. I'm desperately sad that we haven't been able to hang on to Dan in my constituency, and that that creates a, a massive hole uh, in my campaign, and something we're going to be focused very much on trying to do something about. Um, uh, and that leads into the final point I wanted to make, um, uh, which was to really reinforce that you can have whatever strategy and whatever tactics and whatever mechanisms you like. You can get your messages right, you can <coughs> do that, but people matter. Um, and that, that includes our, our volunteers, it includes our campaign staff, and it includes our candidates. Um, now, there were times prior to the Chippenham selection where I had serious doubts about whether I was going to put myself forward to be the candidate. Um, and whilst we could have had a very able candidate in my place, uh, because you know the other candidate that went forward ended up being our candidate in Dorset West, and Sue Farrant ran an excellent campaign there and did a great job with our local party. Um, you know, I wouldn't be standing here today and I wouldn't be working in the House of Commons uh, if I hadn't made that decision to carry on, um, and instead of both of us, there would have been one of us. Um, uh, candidates do burn out. Organisers <coughs> burn out too. Uh, our volunteers burn out. And um, we have got to learn to support our people so that we are going at full speed at the very end of the election, uh, right up to the finishing line. Uh, and you know there are, you know I can think of seats that we could have won if we had been able to sustain what we set out to do when we started, but we burnt out. Um, I experienced something, and my organizer experienced something. And between, I, mean, I don't want to go into detail of it, but you know, between us, we experienced some of those symptoms very shortly after the election, and you know. It, we did nothing to deserve the fact that that happened after the election and not beforehand. Uh, and if it had happened before the election, you know, we'd have been in a right mess and Tim would have had an incredible headache. Um, 
but but we hung on and we got past that line. But you know, that wasn't inevitable. You know, we could have we could have thrown it if we weren't able to carry on to the end. Um, and uh, so you know, there's. I don't think there is anything superhuman, therefore, about the people that do make it all the way through the campaign um, uh, that, um, that we must expect of everyone else. You know, we're all human beings. Uh, we're all volu- almost all of us are volunteers. Certainly the candidates are all volunteers. Um, and uh, our candidates need to treat our volunteers with respect. And uh, our party, in what it asks of our candidates needs to remember that you know we're volunteers too um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that you mustn't select your candidates until very late I- I'm not saying that Paul's wrong about that um, but um, just because that we've now got uh, a number of MPs and some of our MPs go on to be ministers and secretaries of state and the deputy prime minister uh, doesn't mean that they are all the sort of besuited careerists that we saw in the Labour Party and we know, you know how their careers advance. Uh, they are volunteers that give an awful lot of themselves, um, uh, a phenomenal amount of themselves, and uh, I hope that we can continue <coughs> to see that in our colleagues um, as, as, we, as we see how best to support each other on the next campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan, and, and I think you're absolutely right to uh, remind us all of the importance and the personal strain running intense campaigns can put on both candidates, organisers and other helpers. Uh, we have a bit of some time for some questions, so people can try and keep their comments fairly brief and say who they are, and let's start with the gentleman over there in the purple. Jim Murray, I was PPC for Bootle, which is actually the safest uh, Labour seat in the country, and I think it still is, and um, I don't think I'm, although I, um, I, I doubled my votes, it's made no difference whatsoever. Can I just ask Hillary this, um, and it is, uh, it, it is apropos um, what, what I did, which is I went to work in Rainbow Tube for Colin Eldridge, and, um, and, and really focused, but I did notice that even, even on the, the weeks coming up to the election, we had unwinnable seats with people working very hard in those winnable seats. Um, how successful was the Hilary Stevenson stroke, Chris Renard um, edict, which is no, 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 do that which you can succeed at, not which you can fail at. And how successful was it in the last election compared to previous elections? And if it wasn't successful, how are we going to improve that in the, in, the, uh, in the next election? We'll take several questions together and then come back to you for answers uh, just next year. Uh, Kate Gordon, I stood in Tarek Street in Barclay North. Um, it was really, I was talking to another female candidate before I came here, and uh, we've been talking quite a bit since the election about the, basically the, the emotional trauma of losing. <laughs> and uh, it didn't help that a week after the election, my, the party, local party I was starting, in this area, uh, basically booted me off their committee and said, well, we're not interested in you being there now because we've had enough of talking about campaigning and candidates won't get on with being a local, being a local party. So, <laughs> which wasn't the best. <laughs> However, I've, I've put that behind me. But anyway, um, it was really about um, the emotional support kind of side of things. I know it sounds a bit touchy-feely, but frankly, uh, that kind of feeling dropped after the election. And even coming here to the of the conference can be, it can affect whether you want to go forward again. Now I'm lucky in Scotland in that we have Scottish elections and uh, developments there, but um, I guess I'm wondering about after the election and also about when you were talking, Duncan, about treat your volunteers with respect, and I always did that, but sometimes since the election I felt they don't treat me with respect and I'm completely almost dismissed sometimes and I feel that there's this message and about the some people say in other parts of Glasgow, uh, well, we did all that and you didn't win, now it's our turn, when this was only ever the target seat that could win. <coughs> so it's, it's a follow-on from that, but it's also about the emotional support after the election. And the back there. Both Hillary and Paul, they talked about <coughs> the particular time of election. Uh, yet I would agree with this 2014 or January 2015 is do the ideas we get them after every election from the English party. Um, but I'm slightly worried that we, that we are a bit lumbered with 
a complete boundary re review. Because I seem to remember before, before the 97 one, we were quite late selecting for an awful lot of seats. And are, are we any solution to, how to make at least campaigning continue to happen in areas where we have no idea what the boundaries are going to be? Should we just take one more before going to the panel? I think there was. Oh, there was a gentleman at the back there. Yes, yes. <coughs> Just a word to what Jim said. One of the key reasons we didn't get outside support and target seats was local elections. Yeah. That was the killer. And I think if someone's going for a fixed term parliament, they'd better be a bit shrewder than have it on the same day as local elections yeah, if they yeah. want to do any target seats. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a, a major issue. Can I say, in t I just think that sometimes local parties win because they're determined to win, they've got ideas, they've got graft. And I think you can't dismiss that. We want because of graft. We won because actually we realised we had to hit the Tory vote in key places and we hit it there and we deserted other safe places to go. Wait, where, which seat was that? So, so, we, so we, we went and deserted safe bits of the constituency and put well, forward, it's an exaggeration, but a few of us went <laughs> to bits where, the, where the Tories were very, very strong and took them on. And that was a strategy. So I think we have to be aggressive when we define. But for goodness sake, we have fixed term parliaments that don't make them the same day as local elections. Okay, should we, um, should we go for you first, Hilary? I think several of them sort of cover, okay, cover yeah, your areas. I'll, I'll try and be quick on each of those. Um, the, sweet, the, the targeting um, issue, um, and thank you for going to Wayne Tree. Um, we, had, <laughs> we had a, um, a, a huge problem here compared, no, it wasn't as successful. Um, and I touched on one reason why, which was that last surge. And an interesting thing is that um, when you we listen to talk to um, people <coughs> in similar positions in the Labour Party, what they will tell you is that last two weeks did them a huge favour, actually, because it gave them that focus uh, to get in there in the places that counted and listen. Their backs were to the wall as they felt and therefore they managed to, to concentrate in that way. Um, one thing is I don't know in those circumstances where we have that massive sort of sweep, how you get that message through to local activists that in fact, you know, this is a blip, it's gonna be over in a week and a half time. And I think in fairness, we, we knew and we could say that quietly, but it's not exactly what you can say in a world where you've got the whole media exposure on you. We just simply have to have to get um, more of that message over. It's a very hard <coughs> message um, to get to people. We want people to have a will to do the best they can. But maybe part of this is, is what we're now trying to do, which is to focus on saying to people, well, you've got a five-year run of elections. Most of you have got elections almost every year now, one way or another. You need a team which is fighting those with one set of elections. And you need a set of achievements that are going to be staged right the way through that. Possibly that may help to change the focus a little bit from the sort of the, the parliamentary campaign is there just to win the MP in some of those seats where we know we can't do that. So hopefully interim objectives and an integrated plan which we're pushing very hard at the moment is something that might help that. Um, the emotional support stuff, um, I, you know, yes, <laughs> is all I can say to that really and, and we need to continue to be very aware of getting better all the time at doing that stuff I think. Um, because if we don't, we will end up with, with things where we, where we are re regressing to having candidates chosen at the last minute and all those things which we actually know will not work. Um, in terms of timing, um, timing of, um, of selections in terms of boundary changes, I think Mark perhaps ought to say something about this, but fundamentally we can, we do have mechanisms whereby we can uh, have a system. That system has got to be decided, obviously, by the, the candidates' committees around the party. But we can do something. We have had in the past precedents where we've selected before boundary changes. And not only that, I'd make the point that we will have the initial uh, boundary change stuff at the end of next year. And the speed of this whole thing will mean probably there won't be dramatic changes for that. So I think we'll know a lot more than people think we will a lot earlier. And we need to get that message over to uh, those people who are thinking about selections. Duncan, do you want to mm. add, sir? Uh, on uh, targeting and, and what was happening in devel development seats, uh, um, the Chippenham constituency was targeted from very early in the Parliament, um, uh, financially in terms of support from the campaigns department, um, for which we are very grateful. Uh, it's, it's quite a cliff to fall off, but uh, that's a, a sign of quite how <laughs> fortunate I was. As Liam um, Byrne said, we've got no money. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I, I understand. Uh, so um, uh, the, 
nationally and therefore in terms of resources, targeting was a reality. Um, when I look at the support that we got in from outside, uh, it's quite interesting. It was um, very, very clearly two different groups of people. Uh, there was people from Bath who came to make sure we won Chippenham uh, because they were a crack campaign team and they understood targeting and they knew how to win elections um, and they knew that they had Bath <coughs> number one supporter as their candidate, so they were going to be all right. That said, they did a phenomenal amount of canvassing in Bath just to make sure. Uh, but we got a lot of help from Bath um, and it was um, level-headed, you know, as far as I could see, it was, I could have been an appallingly uh, unwelcoming candidate and they'd have still come. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the other group uh, were the people from the rest of Wiltshire and I'd invested a lot of time in making sure, as far as I could, that these people felt they were all part of one team and that um, uh, I, I was part of their campaign. Uh, and that therefore this was something that they were going to do. Uh, that, you know, there was that reaction that I'm sure there was all over the country, given our poll surge and how Nick was doing. Um, and, uh, and so I think they were, they were coming and they were taking part for a very different reason. And uh, you can't rely on everyone behaving like the Bath Lib Dems. So uh, if we want to make people resources, uh, volunteers... Uh, work in a targeting strategy, then you've got to have those relationships with those people up front. Um, I, I think I've said my piece about candidates, so uh, Katie knows I'm with her on that. And on boundaries, um, I'm glad to hear that we're going to be um, past the uncertainty very soon. Um, I'm already exchanging correspondence with James Gray, my neighbouring Tory MP, because he doesn't like me going to events in his constituency. So uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to be too worried about where lines are drawn in terms of making sure that uh, I'm, I'm a champion for Wiltshire in Parliament. Excellent. I mean, just to quickly add on the boundaries thing before handing over to you, Paul, I mean, I think it's worth bearing in mind two things about candidate selection. One is that through the various English, Scottish and Welsh uh, parties and their own democratic processes, the rules will be, are and will be decided in a way that is almost sometimes slightly frustratingly independent of <coughs> party staff and parliamentarians and so on. So part of the answer is what everyone in this room decides to do in terms of making use of those democratic processes. But I would also say a good chunk of people who are in the parliamentary party now are people who didn't wait until a PPC selection to start campaigning and their local party didn't wait until the PPC selection to start campaigning. It's easier in some places, like indeed actually in Scotland and, and in Wales, where we have other high, very high-profile elections that are constituency-wide and region-wide, but everywhere we can campaign even if we don't have a candidate and we don't have an election date and we don't have the boundaries. Minor things like that don't get in the way of campaigning. <laughs> Paul, over to you. Uh, yeah, target seat strategy seems to have largely disappeared over the last 15 years uh, in some ways. In the 90s, when I was a campaign organiser, and then 2001... It was very hard, hard in a good way, that they said to um, candidates who were not for target seats that part of your assessment after the election will be, did you take a team to help in your target seat nearby? Uh, and as far as I know, that, that's disappeared now. Um, we wouldn't have won in 2001 without the outside help. And we had people, I mean, but we were the only target seat in the whole East Midlands then, and we had people from Northampton and Leicester and so on. We, we held it in 2005 without any outside help, this time, you know, I said we just narrowly missed. Um, <coughs> three out of 48, 46 constituencies were asked to go and help us. One was derelict. It's PPC, worked for me anyway. So uh, the other two, as I say, just refused to come because they were going to win and they came third. Um, uh, so the, tar the, 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 the pushing people to help in target seats does, does seem to have uh, dwindled away a lot. And, you know, I mean, I know in some regions at the moment, and it's happening in these Midlands, that the uh, regional executives... Uh, regional parties are saying what campaigns department staff there are, we want to spread them thin to grow the party everywhere, ready for future PR elections. Well, when we've got PR you might start doing that, but we've not got PR, we're not going to go with AB, that's not PR, even if we win the referendum, you know spreading it, spreading it thin, you win nothing, um, you know uh, aftercare, there's none, it's pathetic I was talking to Graham Tolt last night Lord Tolt, and, and he was sympathising with me about losing, uh, you know, and he said uh, 30 years ago it was the same, one minute he's the centre of, of the, the Liberal Party, he loses his election and it's like, he's dead. No, nobody gets in touch, nobody, you know. And I know that people like Lucy Kerr, who was a target seat candidate in Derby, Carol Woods, 
in Durham, we were, I've campaigned with both a lot over the years, they rang me up after the election, we were commiserating with each other, but nobody rang them, by and large, nobody offers yeah. that support, and, and that, that is poor, Graham Tope was saying, you know, if they've not improved it 30, 35 years on, when are we going to, to do something? Um, early selection, yeah, you should, they, they should be allowed to get on with formal selection, um, but there are the I know there were provisions before that if boundary changes made more than a 10 15 percent difference or something you'd have to have a reselection well fine you know they can sign for that but, but uh, as Mark says you know if, if somebody wants to get elected they should be campaigning now and uh, they, they go and campaign so that when the selection comes that the party members in that area say yeah well they're the only one because of the work they've done but you know if, if you want to win in 2015 you should be out campaigning now this summer. Thank you, Paul. I'm afraid we're about to be chucked out of this room, uh, but just to, uh, I guess, actually briefly say one thing following on from Paul's comments. I was quite struck when I uh, sort of steeled myself to sit down and make some phone calls on the Saturday after, after the election to ring sort of friends and people I knew who had stood and lost. Actually, how few other people seem to be ringing them. So I think, if nothing else, if people bear in mind that next May uh, there will be many people who have fantastic victories, there will also be some people who sadly lose out. And it can be as gutting if you really want to be a councillor to lose out in a local election as it is a general election. So maybe you know, hit the phones and ring, ring people a little more uh, than, than collectively we all have done in the past. Thank you very much for coming along today. I'm afraid we. As I said, we've run out of time. However, these sorts of issues are regularly discussed and debated on, on the blog, on LibDemVoice.org. So you are very welcome through the rest of the year to contribute guest posts, comment on blog posts, or discuss issues in the forum. And just quickly to say, if you do want to, uh, if you've missed out on the sign-up sheets that went around at the beginning, Helen, do you know where they are? Have you got the sign-up sheets there? If you have a word with Helen, she'll be able to capture your details and sell it to an American company or something like that. <laughs> but thank you very much all for coming along, and if you could just thank our speakers.